Good evening and welcome to Responding to COVID-19 on TTT Talk City 91.1 FM and TTT Live Online on Facebook. I am Wesley Gibbons. Now, actions taken by world governments to address the risks posed by the pandemic are having wide-ranging impacts. This program has been examining a wide variety of those posed by the virus itself and measures being applied to address it. This evening, we will spend a little time looking at the diagnoses of global agencies on the question of macroeconomic conditions and their implications for the domestic economy. To assist us conduct an, evalu an evaluation is UWI economist, Dr. Valmiki Arjun. Good evening, Dr. Arjun. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. Now, the outlook globally is not the most optimistic one that we, we can find. In fact, there are observers who are, who are noting that post the Great Depression, they, we have never witnessed anything like this at the international level. What are your feelings on that kind of assessment? Yeah, well, uh, quite, right, quite rightly so. The IMF have recently uh, indicated that um, this could very well be as bad or potentially worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s era. Um, we have now gone from projected positive growth for the global economy, we're speaking of here, projected positive growth for the global economy earlier this year to now a projected, projected decline of about negative uh, 3%. And this, this has virtually happened overnight, particularly because of the, the impact of the COVID-19 fallout. Um, one, one of the key things that, that has really led to this, this, this huge economic fallout is the fact that there's a supply problem and also a demand problem. There's a fallout with supply and a fallout with demand. Supply in, in the sense that many companies, the, 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 the vast majority of the global private sector would have either shut down their operations completely or partially shut down uh, their operations, which means that many people are not working across the globe. Many people are, are forced to stay at home in self-isolation as we are currently doing here in the Caribbean and the wider, and in, in, in Trans Big One and the wider Caribbean region. So companies are not operating. Of course, if they're not operating, they're not generating any sort of revenues. Therefore, the level of taxes that they have to pay are going to be very dim. The level of production that comes out of these companies are also going to be very grim at, that, at, at, at the same time. And therefore, you're looking at, a, at, at an overall drop in the production levels and the GDP levels of, of the entire economy. Confident business confidence levels are at an all-time historical low. Uncertainty as to what happens with the global economy and its future is, is, is also basically at an all-time low. Um, there's the, 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 the added problem of a collapse in asset prices, particularly oil and gas prices. In fact, uh, just today, checking it out uh, before, before we started our discussion, uh, world sorry, uh, West Texas Intermediate uh, oil prices would have dropped to a low of $19.68. So it's gone below $20 a barrel. Brent is about $27.36. And now natural gas, gas global price is about $1.60. So this is all happening against the backdrop of the, the largest cut in oil production in history. OPEC has agreed recently, last week, as, as you would know, to cut production by about 9.7 million barrels of oil per day. The US, Canada, and Brazil, they're cutting, they have agreed to cut production by about, by, by about uh, uh, three, three and a half million barrels of oil per day as well, and Mexico by about 100,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, but despite these, the, these agreements for cuts, the market hasn't really been impressed. The market has not responded the way we would have hoped. And that is because even though there's a drop in the supply of, of these energy commodities, the demand for these energy commodities is, is substantially low right now. The, the, the cut in supply has not been enough to offset that massive fall in demand. And a large reason for that massive fall in demand is the fact that many people are in self-isolation. Countries are now isolated, borders are locked down. So the demand for energy, as it, as, as it used to be, is, is, is simply not there any longer. And in fact, demand for energy has been falling radically in these last few years. And now it has taken an even more significant dip, which has now led us to these very, very depressing energy prices. And of course, 
when energy prices are this depressing, it means that our revenues, TNT revenues by extension, uh, are, are going to be quite low. No, you, we you also have word, a problem you, you, of a, production. You, no, you use a word um, that, that the Prime Minister in his press conference this afternoon, this afternoon used more than once, and that's the question of certainty. Now, certainly for uh, business investment, for social stability, which you need, you need conditions of, of stability and coherence uh, in order to talk, start talking about economic development. So certainty is, is very much a part of the game. And then when you add to that, I mean, at the best of times, the energy sector is influenced by a, a high level of uncertainty because you have these external factors that you have to deal with. Now, yeah, how because we're a price taker, we're yeah. not a price maker. Exactly. So, I mean, in terms of coping mechanisms to address the nervousness of both of the, the, the global markets and so what's, what's translating into a level of domestic nervousness now by our business sector and by people who rely on the business sector, what sort of remedies are you seeing possible to be implanted beyond... Uh, of course, the social support that we know the government um, has already uh, started to implement. Right. Well, I think first, first and foremost, it's important to understand where we were before we got to the the, the, the COVID nineteen stage. Yeah. Um, before at, at the end of this, at the end of twenty nineteen and December twenty nineteen, our economy would have actually uh, declined by about nine point seven percent in the last six years. So when you go from twenty thirteen. 2019, you're looking at a drop in our GDP, in our economy, uh, our, our economic growth of about 9.7%. So that's almost a 10% drop in, in about six years. Now, that being said, yes, we, we know we've had a substantial decline in, 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 in our revenue earnings. Um, our expenditure levels have, have, have taken a, a huge cut as well. We've had to pay careful attention as to which specific areas we spend our monies on, given that our oil, oil and gas revenues were nowhere near uh, previous levels over a decade ago. Um, and now, we, we, like the rest of the world, we are now facing a challenge, but it's a necessary challenge of increased expenditure on healthcare. So one of the one of the, the, the things that the state have, have, has got to, to pay careful attention to and, and expect to do more of within these coming months, if not years, again, depending on the trajectory of the virus, is increased expenditure on healthcare. And that being said, they should not hesitate to spend more on healthcare at, at, at the same time. Now, earlier I was speaking about the, the implications of, of, of the, um, on the globe. And remember, we, are very, we live in a very globalized atmosphere, a very globalized environment. And that gives us the, the problems of supply chain issues locally here in Trinidad and Tobago. We are, we are extremely import intensive. When you look at various items that we import on, on an annual basis, we import for food, and for instance, annually for the last four years on average, we imported about $6.1 billion worth of food items. And when you look at other essentials like pharmaceuticals, we import on average close to $1 billion each year on average on pharmaceuticals and medicinal items. Now, given the massive damage to, to, to the global supply chain that is happening right now and could potentially worsen in, in the coming weeks to months, we're going to find that our ability to continue to import these items is going to be significantly stymied. One, because they're going to be restricted. The companies that, that, that manufacture them, the countries that manufacture them are going to attempt to hold back as much as they can in order to feed themselves and to, to treat themselves and medicate themselves first. And whatever is left, then they're going to supply to the, to, 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 to the rest of, of countries. That's one as aspect of it. Two, if there, if there, there are restrictions, if, if there's a drop in the supply, the production of these items globally, then what does that mean? It means that prices of these items globally are going to go up. And remember, countries, especially countries like us, are not going to be earning substantial revenues as we would have liked to. So our ability to import, our ability to pay for these items are again going to be significant, at least time eat within the, the coming weeks uh, to and then months. I think we could add to that, that even if we talk about our manufacturing and other productive sectors, yeah. there are heavy inputs uh, yeah. upon whom uh, we rely on others for significantly, even in the food sector. We were talking. Let me, let me give you an idea sector. of the figures okay. here. Okay. You, you have, 
the, the, the United States, we import the vast majority of, of, of our total import value from the United States, about $13.8 billion on average each year for the last four years. And much of that comes for retail purposes where we purchase items to resell here locally, but not just that. Many raw materials, other inputs are for the production process like machinery, parts of machinery, other types of technologies, etc. Now, in the month of March, the manufacturing sector in the United States faced a huge hit. There's an indicator that I want to introduce you all to. It's known as the Purchasing Managers Manufacturing Indicator Index. Purchasing Managers Manufacturing Index. And that looks at the, the, the uh, production levels or the performance of the manufacturing sector for several key countries globally. If it's a value of 50 and above 50, it means that the production in the manufacturing sector is increasing, it's doing well. If it drops below 50, it's not, it means it's falling. So when you look at the United States, again, our major uh, trading partner, it, it, in fact, it dropped to about 48.5, uh, the, the indicator dropped to about 48.5 in, 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 in March. When you look at other countries that we import, again, a lot of inputs from, in March, it dropped for Japan 44.8. In the UK, it dropped about 47.8. So all of them have gone below 50, which means a downturn in the manufacturing activity. And then, of course, to the extent that we rely on China, China itself went through its its period. Yeah. Now, I mean, there's now, a little the bit funny of a thing is that yeah. China China dropped in in in, in February to about 40.3, but then in March it went right back up to 50. Yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a an, another upswing, but we'll get to that in a bit. We, when, when you find that these countries, especially the United States, faces a lot of delays when they need to get their raw materials and whatever other inputs for production to manufacture items in order to export to us, when they face that, and 75% of companies in the US would have faced de extreme delays in the month of March, that means naturally we will face delays in acquiring these items. And that we, we're starting to see the impact of that here already. It's not just manufacturing items, it's also going to be items that we consume, consumables on a daily basis. I mentioned the food items, there's things like toiletries. Uh, I also mentioned uh, uh, medication as well, clothing items, etc. Uh, remember, we are so import intensive that our import levels are going to take a serious hit because of the, 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 um, the downturn in the global supply chain, the disruption in the global uh, supply chain locally. But it's not just that. We also have to look at the other structural obstacles to trade that is happening right now. The United States, again, our biggest trading partner, they face a decline in exports of about 95% between January to March. So what that has meant is that we were not able to import as much as we would have liked to from them. But why is that? It's not just because of the supply chain disruptions. It's also because many shipping and logistics companies have to temporarily close down their operations. Many ports as well had to cl temporarily close on their operations. I'll just give you an example. The port of Shanghai back in, in February and March, they faced a down, because of, of a downscaling of their operations, they faced a downturn in the container throughput of about 20%. The port of Savannah in the United States and the port of Los Angeles, both of them faced a drop in container throughput of about between 20 and 23%. The port in Hong Kong faced a drop of about 11%, and these are major global ports. In India, many ports have closed their operations with the exception of that of Mumbai. So when there's, there's less ports operating, that means even if you, you were able to contact your supplier and get the goods there, they agreed to send you these goods and you were also able to pay them. Let's assume you have no foreign exchange problems yeah. to pay them, and you do pay them, how are they going to send it to right. you? No, we're focusing, so, we're, fo we're focusing so far on, on the imports and the transport lanes and the, and the supply uh, chain that services that. But what about the exports? Because you talk about our significant export markets, which would include the United States, uh, the, the CARICOM countries, and then, of course, with LNG, we are looking for new yep, markets, yep. Chile, uh, China, and so on. So we are really talking about a situation in which it's not only the incoming but it's the disruption to the outgoing. Of now, course, so yeah. 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 Now, I, I've been t talking to people about what's happening in the CARICOM region, for example, and that if there is not a speedy recovery, a, a, a return to a level of stability, then our manufacturing sector in particular 
is going to face well, some fallout. Well, yeah, so, so, okay. So we can look at it from two perspectives. One, the fact that, that um, many of our food processors export to, the, to these other Caribbean countries, right? Just to give you an idea, Barbados and on average, the average uh, value of exports we, we would have uh, provided to them in the last uh, three to four years was about $1.3 billion. Jamaica was about $2.1 billion, St. Lucia about $513 million, right? These are all in TT dollars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just just to, to, to throw that in there. Now, a lot of these, as I mentioned, are, are consumable items, particularly items coming out of the food processing industry, food items. But if we are facing delays to get some of these food items, these raw materials, as we just mentioned, from the United States and other countries, in order to produce them here, to, 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 to finish the production process here, and then export them to these other Caribbean countries, then naturally our exports are also going to take a hit. So not just our production levels, once your production levels take a hit, it means your export levels are going to drop. No, but in exactly. addition to that- I want to come, come back to that, Mickey, because because we, we have to go to a break now, because the other a, a feature of that is that if the tourism economies collapse, uh, the tourism economies are what provide the fuel for- The revenue, the sources of revenue. If they don't have revenue, revenue, how are they going to yeah. be able to buy from us? Okay, so we're going to go to a break and we'll come right back with that question. Welcome back to Responding to COVID-19 on TTT Talk City 91.1 FM and TTT Live Online on Facebook. I'm Wesley Gibbons. With me this evening is UWI economist, Dr. Valmiki Arjun, and we are looking at the wider economic impacts of the pandemic, not only on the world, but on Trinidad and Tobago. And before we went to the break, we were talking about the impacts uh, of, of disruptions globally on our capacity not only to import vital inputs into the productive sectors, but also the ability to export to the traditional markets. And we were on the point of the CARICOM market. So uh, uh, Valmiki, like, perhaps you can resume that discussion. Sure, yes. So as I indicated before the break, um, much if not all of our CARICOM markets, um, and in fact, by extension, all of the countries that we export items to, they are going to face a serious downturn in the amount of revenues that they earn. They're going to face a serious downturn even on the foreign exchange that they earn. I remember trade takes place in US dollars. Because of this, we are not going to be able to export as much items as we would have naturally hoped to to, 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 these, to these various countries. Now, we know that a lot of these countries um, have started to implement many stimulus packages, what they're calling stimulus packages. But I just want to point out, it's not, it's not really a stimulus package at this stage. At this stage, it's a survival package. Yes. Well, what we're doing, for example, it's really meant to ensure that there's still a, a level of consumption happening in the economy, still a level of business activity happening here so that the economy does not exactly grind to a halt. And that is what other, other countries have been doing. So the idea is that, take, take for example, Jamaica. What Jamaica has done, their, their government has done many similar policies to what we have implemented as well, but they've also gone the additional step, which is what we can consider doing in the near future of providing additional cash flows to not just those who would have lost their jobs and those who are vulnerable in society, but they've also provided cash flows to companies that are struggling. And I think if we were to consider our, one of the grants that, 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 that the government is currently offering, the fiscal initiatives, the salary relief grant, yeah. um, that is, is supposed to, to ease the burden of many individuals for the next three months who would have, who would, who would have gone jobless. Now depending again on, on how long uh, we, the, the trajectory or, or the fallout of the virus lasts, we could be looking at an unemployment rate in Trinidad and in Tobago that is the highest we've ever seen, between 22 and 25%, peaking at 25% at some point later this year. So that means in that particular instance, there are going to be hundreds of, there are going to be thousands of people, sorry, that, that are that are eligible to receive this $1,500. Now, $1,500 may not necessarily go a long way for many, many people, especially since a lot of people tend to live paycheck to paycheck, and many of them have rent to pay. Yeah. The average cost of rent uh, is about $2,500 a month. Now, what we could have done 
is taking a, a, an approach similar to Jamaica and even the United Kingdom. In the UK, the government paid eight, agreed to pay 80%, up to 80% of the wages of struggling companies. So rather than providing people who lost their jobs with a relief grant, what we could have done and what we could explore in the near future is in, in interjecting in the companies directly and providing the company with the money so that they can in turn pay a portion. It may not have to be 80%, yes. let's say about 50, 40, 50, 60%. Of, of the wages and that the employer pays the rest. In our discussion with the, the, the chamber recently, um, that kind of idea came up because I think one of the, the problems during these on um, these depressed conditions is that you're going to have continuing shortfalls in government revenue. Of course. In, in, yeah. From where? The, the absence of taxes. And of if course, you yeah. don't have functioning companies that are generating, generating surpluses such that you, they have, they're paying taxes, then you're going to have a problem. So, yeah. I, so, yeah, so this ensures that the company itself. keeps running, that they have a workforce, because at the end of the day, yes, you're paying a, a salary relief grant, but these people don't have job security. They don't have a job to go back into. So you're in, by, by taking such a, a, a different approach, you're ensuring that there's still a labor force for this particular company. They may have to take a pay cut at some point in time. There's um, maybe possibly no two ways about that but you're ensuring that there still is a labor supply so that the company and, and the company still has some form of finances to continue their operation. Because remember, this is not the only grant. There's other, uh, from the monetary uh, policy aspect of things, where the central bank and commercial banks have also uh, stepped in, which they must be commended for doing as well, to, to assist um, the, the, the economy right now. So let's take, for example, the monetary side, right? Which again, many other countries across the globe are currently doing. They've cut interest rates and they've provided moratoriums in, in various loans and mortgages, etc. Now, what, what we have to be cognizant of here in Trinidad and Tobago going forward is that, yes, we have given lower interest rates. Yes, we have given an extension uh, or a three-month moratorium at this point in time. Other countries have given up to about six months. But then what happens thereafter? Countries like us have to pay careful attention to the fiscal and monetary policy that's going to happen after we flatten the curve. Because remember, the fallout is not just going to be when the virus is, just, is, is active as it is right now. If we do manage to get this thing contained, hopefully sooner rather than later, country, companies are not going to just be able to pick up where they left off. Exactly. There's going to be a transition period into what we call the, 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 the new normal. However, what banks can consider what they need to consider uh, doing right now is looking carefully at the, this prime lending rate that they offer to their clients. Initially, the, the Minister of Finance would have indicated that, the, the, that they, were, they managed to drop the prime lending rate to about 6%. This is the rate of interest that you give to your best customer, your most credit worthy customer. So in other words, a large company, a lot of collateral and a good history with the bank would probably be able to get that 6%. But in reality, what's going to happen is that some of them may actually get a, 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 an interest rate below 6%, which means that a small company coming for a loan may have to pay the compensation rate for that, which could be about a 7% or an 8%. So that will drive up their cost of, of, of borrowing as well. No, no, no. So some, I think companies, some companies and small operators in particular are talking about what's happening even now with respect to interest payments and the accumulation yeah. of interest. What do you think would be a, a, a good direction for the banking sector and the country as a whole to, to adopt when it comes to that difficulty? Right. So, so the banking sector, um, again, as I, I as I said earlier, they should be commended for for, for, for providing these moratoriums uh, right now. But but many have started to complain about um, compounding interest. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, they're, they're starting to, to to complain about uh, compounding interest. I thought it would have actually been better to give this three month window um, where there's no compounding interest and at the end of, 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 the, um, of, of the loan tenure, you give one year where the monies that were supposed to pay within that three months are allowed to be paid. So you give them an additional 12 months to pay off whatever principal and interest that they were supposed to, 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 to accrue or to pay at that particular and you point. think the banking sector has the, the where it all to, to um, implement something like that? At this point in time, I think they do because if, if you look at the the, um, the level of profits that the banking sector would have made over the last four years, I mean, companies at Republic Bank were, were, were hitting over a billion dollars per year. 
on, on average within the last uh, three to four years, and that's when we were, the economy was in a recession. The banking sector was, was performing powerfully. So I would say at this point in time, they are able to, to, um, to provide uh, these, these sort of, um, of incentives then to the, uh, uh, or ease, easing the burdens then to, 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 to the private sector. They, we will, however, need, uh, there, there is going to definitely be a necessity of offering more loans and at lower interest rates in the near future, especially after we have supposedly uh, flattened the curve. Other countries have indicated that they're well aware they're going to start doing this. The IMF have pointed this out as well, and, and we're going to, we, we are likely to very well see this happening um, in, in, in the very well, near Mickey, future. Well, Mickey Arjun, we certainly have to invite you back to finish some of these points that I know we have only discussed very preliminarily. But I want to thank you very much for coming with us. There's one quick point I wanted to, to mention, given that we are seeing governments borrowing at this point in time. We have to ensure that there's sufficient liquidity left in the banking system and in the country so that both the government and the private sector can borrow. There must be monies available to borrow at this point in time. Thank you very much, Dr. Valmiki Arjun, economist at UWI. I'm Wesley Gibbing saying thank you very much for staying with us on responding to COVID-19 on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, and TTT Live Online. Please stay home, stay safe, and save a life.